right, let's get through this thing. Um, I didn't make this meme. Uh, it's been a, I know it's been a minute. Some of y'all been thirsty for the, my meme game. But uh, as I've mentioned to some of you, it takes me about an hour to make a lecture. It takes me about an hour and a half to do the research and, you know, get inside the head of a real meme lord uh, and then craft it, you know, all of that stuff. So don't have time. So, but this one's, I took this from Reddit. Um, this is from a Sherman Antitrust Act is in a previous chapter, but, you know, still relevant. Um, and then this is also maybe previous chapter. I think William Jennings Bryan might be in here again. I think maybe he runs for president again. This is original as of last year, so it's a little stale, but it's a classic. It's a classic. William Jennings Bryan, he always, he's always running for president. Um, this was um, um, more uh, uh, temporal or, or uh, when I first made it. Uh, the meme formats. I know there's older Bernie Sanders memes have been uh, eclipsed by the Mittens one. Um, and then this is also old format, but Woody Woo looking slick in all of his social media looks. Uh, okay, so that's that. Let's talk about World War One. It's a mess, man. Um, I'm not going to belabor this. Uh, I, I'm going to kind of just emphasize the stuff that's important for American history. So, you know, do you need to know about, you know, Franz Ferdinand or the Black Hand or whatever? No, it doesn't really, or Verdun or uh, the Maginot Line. That was a great idea. Um, uh, so, no. <clears throat> There's Maginot Line, First World War, Second World War. Maginot Line, Second World War. Um, so, um, I, I still have opportunity to make fun of it, uh, when I lecture about that. So alliances, right? Um, what does it go? Mania, militarization, alliances, nationalism, imperialism. What's the last A stand for? Mania. That's the acronym that you're supposed to remember to remember the inputs of the war. But what's that last A stand for? I don't know. Okay. <clears throat> well, anyway, militarism, um, uh, uh, nationalism, imperialism, all that stuff. The United States gets in late in the game. They're, the United States is in World War One for like 20 minutes. Um, but it's a, a major turning point in American history because it is the, you know, the first, you know, act one of America's military interventions in uh, like on the in the in the like European theater, right? Uh, so like not just like little Banana Republic stuff or the Spanish American War, but like obviously World War Two, we'll see it, and then Vietnam, on and on and on. So we're going to focus on the American stuff. Um, again, World War One is a global war, right? It's a world war. Um, uh, all of these, you know, tons of people um, from all over the world dying because it's again that I. For imperialism, this is an imperial war, but we're not going to get into it. We're going to be um, uh, nationalistic and just look at the American stuff. So <clears throat> in the United States, a lot of people don't want to go to war. Uh, a lot of people don't want to get involved in European, uh, uh, a big European mess. Uh, and that goes across the spectrum, right? Populists don't like it because they they just want to like have their farm, right? And they don't want to get involved with some European nonsense. Um, progressives don't like it because war doesn't make sense. It's an anachronism in the modern, right, progressive world. You should be able to sort this stuff out diplomatically. Uh, socialists don't like it because it's always, right, workers of the world killing each other while other people profit. So all kinds of people don't want to go to war. And the majority of Americans don't want to go to war. It's only particular unique circumstances that actually push public opinion and um, Wilson to actually uh, go to war. There is, however, a lot of anti-German sentiment. Uh, Americans start, you know, a lot of German Americans change their names, cities change their names, um, uh, a lot of anti-German stuff. And this term, the Hun, uh, 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 um, was applied to the Germans, that they were Huns, right? Somehow from, you know, uh, in, invaders from the East kind of thing. 
Um, so anti-German sentiment. Um, build up to war. Wilson doesn't want to do it. He runs, right? His campaign slogan when he runs for re-election is he kept us out of war. Kind of like a big like campaign slogan you're going to want to deliver on. He beats Charles Evans Hughes, man with the goatee. Charles Evans Hughes, an interesting political figure because he's a governor of New York. Then he's a Supreme Court justice, and then he runs for president. <laughs> then he goes back to the Supreme Court. Um, uh, an interesting uh, character. Okay, eventually he does go to war. Why? Um, because um, the... Uh, uh, the Germany knows that the United States is eventually going to enter into war, right? It's going to happen sooner or later. So kind of like, you know, it, it, the United States is one train, right, on a track, slowly building up momentum, right? And it's a big train with a lot of people, and a lot of weapons, and a lot of power. What Germany needs to do, it's a train on the same track, it needs to go as fast as possible this way to stop the United States before it builds up too much momentum and strategy and planning and, you know, material war stuff. So unrestricted sub warfare kind of seems like, well, that doesn't make sense. You're going to get the United States into World War One, but the idea is you need to inflict as much damage as possible, as fast as possible, so that you can at least have the United States maybe starting off the war back on its heels a little bit, as opposed to with a full head of steam right coming at you doesn't work, right? Um, Zimmerman Telegram, obviously, dee, 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 uh, they want Mexico to join. Mexico says, like, <laughs> no, no, thank you. We are not going to invade the United States uh, inside with Germany. Telegram is intercepted. It's kind of a big deal. Um, and then lastly, the Russian Revolution, right? So the Russian Revolution um, changes the Eastern Front. It blocks it, stops it, right? So the World War One becomes a one-front war, not a two-front war um, because uh, the Soviet, the, the, the Reds, who are, um, there's a whole civil war thing happening, um, but the Reds, who the Bolsheviks, who then become the Soviet Union, uh, negotiate a, pre a, a, a peace treaty, um, and uh, that changes the calculus of World War I. Um, Wilson later sends actually financial support uh, to the whites, the other faction of the U.S. Civil War in the uh, Russian Civil War. Um, so that doesn't engender a lot of um, goodwill on the part of the Soviets. Uh, okay, central planning. This is we've learned about laissez-faire economics. Uh, this ain't laissez-faire economics. This is straight up central planning, planned economy, because in a crisis, it works. Uh, laissez-faire economics says that if the American public want to buy teddy bears, then uh, American industry is going to crank out teddy bears. Uh, teddy bears don't help you win a war, right? So you need like different kinds of stuff to win a war. So laissez-faire economics ain't going to work if you're trying to win a war um, uh, uh, and you want to win it quickly. So central planning of the U.S. economy in order to win the war. Um, the Food Administration uh, under Herbert Hoover, we'll learn more about him later, uh, gets Americans to eat less, meatless Fridays, meatless Mondays, rationing, uh, all kinds of stuff. Uh, the Fuel Administration um, uh, closes non-essential factories. Um, everyone turns their lights out early. I also like this... Um, uh, <laughs> like this poster because it's like seems like uncle sam maybe didn't go to the sexual harassment training uh maybe he skipped that day <laughs> uh because uncle sam uh he needs that uh it's a little maybe need to that worker needs to maybe say something to the to the boss about um uncle sam's behavior down there in the foundry um anyway fuel administration people don't use fuel, it shuts down non-essential factories. All of this stuff is really important, especially now talking about the pandemic, like COVID. Like, look at what Americans do. Look at the sacrifices Americans make and the unity that Americans display in order to come together to win against this adversary, right? Um, people can't even be bothered to like put a tiny piece of fabric on their face right, uh, in the 21st century, where in 1917, uh, uh, <laughs> can you imagine any of this stuff now? Again, like, people can't even be bothered to, like, not, like, eat some, you know, 
some bad brunch or whatever. It's like, oh, my freedoms. I can't have like some overcooked eggs. Uh, my freedoms. So like you look at, again, uh, uh, this time period of the 19 teens, Americans feeling very unified um, and very patriotic and feeling them that it's part of their civic duty as citizens to make sacrifices to win uh, the war. Daylight savings is a product of this time period because again, saving um, uh, electricity, uh, gasless Sundays, right? Don't use any gas. So effectively like the Sabbath, um, like a genuine interpretation of the Sabbath. Don't turn any gas, don't nothing, nothing, nothing. Um, lightless nights, turn your lights off. The railroads are nationalized, right? Nationalize the railroads. Um, industrial workers all get rights. They promise not to strike. Um, and then they'll talk about wage hikes uh, after the war. So again, kind of incredible. Um, you know, uh, Kroger, I think, in the last year, um, made uh, doubled their profits, um, and in at least in Long Beach, there was a recent law, this Hero Pay, where grocery workers would get four dollars an hour extra, and uh, Kroger immediately shut down two of its grocery stores in Long Beach. Um, like again, that they made double profit last year, but they can't spend you know a couple extra dollars for uh, um, you know baggers or whatever. Look at what happens during World War One. Um, so again, very, very different time period. The kind of patriotism that people feel, um, the sense of duty uh, to towards their fellow citizens, and that everyone is in it together to beat right an adversary. Um, again, very, very different time period, uh, and a very different understanding of freedom. I mean, this is a philosophical kind of concept, um, but again, the idea that you have to make sacrifices in order to maintain your freedom. Um, is paramount in this time period where now it's kind of like, well, no, I like, I just want freedom to do whatever the heck I want, whenever I want. And, and that's freedom. Uh, and any kind of sacrifice uh, is an infringement on my whatever. Um, it doesn't, it, it, from a, from a political philo philosophy standpoint, it doesn't make any sense at all. Um, but you know, people think what they want to think. Um, committee and public information, speaking of people thinking what they want to think, um, this is the agency in charge of all of that, what we would call propaganda, right? All those posters. This famous poster is from the Committee on Public Information. Um, obviously, this is a time period where the entire economy is shifted towards winning the war, and everyone gets involved with writing plays, making art, um, even the socialists get on board, uh, intellectuals uh, are all this, I mean, you look back to this previous, I make fun of this, you know, this one in particular, but I mean, these are like all the artistic stuff of this time period you see, um, uh, and almost even like a little kind of socialist realism here with this one. Um, so that is all of that stuff. And we'll go through these images maybe more in class, right? all of these different, all of these images are produced by the Committee on Public Information, uh, getting women to join in for the war effort, um, uh, or shaming men into joining, um, um, uh, evoking the spirit of black freedom to get black Americans to join, um, and they do in large numbers. Um, uh, uh, getting immigrants on board, right? Newly arrived immigrants uh, involved in the project um, uh, here, right? Uh, uh, Jewish Americans. Remember, Jewish Americans in the 19 teens, there's no Israel, right? So in terms of like um, a, a promised land where you can escape um, the, I mean, there's still anti-Semitism in this time period, but the pogroms and the kind of terrible stuff that Jews face in Eastern Europe, the United States is like, it's amazing, right? So it is kind of a promised land and a lot of Jewish Americans feel very patriotic for that reason. Um, Italians, all kinds of different people. Um, and again, a lot of anti-German sentiment, the, the Germans being um, kind of marauders, very violent. Um, here is an, this is an English ad, but right, that effectively a German is a German, whether they're on the field attacking you or trying to sell you something, right? Very anti-German. 
even dachshunds get it, man. Come on, you know, even dachshunds get uh, a bad uh, name in this time period. Uh, this is an American. Obviously, you have here like the right, the patriot in the background, uh, and then the kid. Uh, I'm assuming it's a toy gun. I think the dachshund doesn't get hurt. Um, but a lot of people change their last names, if they're German last names, um, Anaheim notwithstanding, um, but other uh, cities do. Um, and then here, this is some German propaganda, actually, of, about the war, um, about women, you know, their duty or whatever. So anyway, I'm going to get through this quickly. As I said, there's a couple more slides here. Um, too much. Uh, some so the United States government takes a strong, strong hand in centralizing the economy in order to win the war. American citizens get on board. Um, not always a good thing, right? The United States does go a little bit overboard. Espionage Act and the Sedition Act. Um, uh, we've seen this with the all the way back to the Adams administration. These moments of national crisis. These um, uh, acts that either uh, go overboard with curtailing uh, your civil liberties or freedom of speech, freedom of press, uh, etc. Lots of people are prosecuted, including Eugene Debs, uh, who goes to jail. Again, remember Eugene Debs, Pullman strike. Um, uh, he goes to jail uh, and uh, uh, under the uh, Sedition Act. Um, Schenck versus United States, very important Supreme Court decision. Um, which effectively establishes um, uh, uh, clear and present danger, right? The idea of uh, um, you can suspend uh, free speech, suspend your First Amendment rights to free speech, um, if the Speech Act constitutes what they would understand as a, what for Schenck was clear and present danger. That's the language in Schenck that is no longer applicable. Um, there's a, a Brandenburg decision in 1969 uh, superseded Schenck uh, and establishes imminent lawless action. So that is now the um, uh, the gold standard for the ability to curtail freedom of speech is actually imminent law that the speech potentially threatens imminent lawless action. Um, that will be interesting with the second impeachment trial to see if that kind of precedent uh, is cited, the Brandenburg decision, 1969, um, in terms of um, inciting the riot, right? Was is someone gonna say that there was imminent lawless action? If you hear that phrase, that's Brandenburg. Um, but in um, the 19 teens, it's Schenck versus the United States, and that establishes clear and present danger um, uh, and this is, goes way back, right? So even before Schenck, um, this notion that if, uh, if any kind of speech, um, uh, was, uh, uh, had a, what I think in English common law is called a bad tendency, um, something to harm the public good, you could, um, you could censor it either beforehand or after, right? Um, prior restraint or then punishment afterwards. Um, so anyway, I don't need to get into too much of that now. Um, Selective Services Act effectively is a draft. Um, almost three million people are drafted. Women enter the workforce. Um, Mexicans migrate to work in agriculture and mining. The, the U.S. border is nothing right in this time period. It's not some kind of like militarized uh, zone like it is in the 21st century. There have been for generations migratory flows of, you know, people leave Mexico, they go north, they work, they get money, they go back home, right? They spend the winter in Mexico, they go back, they work, they come back home. Um, so that's encouraged during this time period to replace the jobs that have been lost to the draft. Um, the war ends 1918. Oh, this is just a like, this is a little bit of like history that I think people find interesting. Um, in 1918, the war ends and the armistice is signed in this particular train car. Um, it's a particular train car that the Germans surrender in. And in 1940, the Germans, when it's the French, their turn to surrender to the Germans, they go and get, they dig up the same train car. I think it was in a museum and they make the French sign right the the surrender in the same train car so like uh, we'll learn a lot of things about the nazis they're very bad people on many levels but they petty 
they also very petty um and then they blow it up right so i think in in the in the, the 11th hour of war when it was clear that they weren't gonna that france was gonna win again um, and the united states and the soviet union they blew the thing up again so they wouldn't have to be back in it a lot of people die uh, a lot of people die. So you see the United States way down here at the bottom. Um, again, the United States isn't in it for very long. Uh, you, you have other countries, kind of massive, massive numbers. Um, as always, Russia, um, you know, you don't want to be a peasant in Russia, <laughs> right? Um, in particular, anywhere uh, west of Moscow uh, is not a good, not going to be a good place to be. Um, because effectively you are one of the, uh, if you're a peasant, you are one of the uh, things that's going to slow down an invading uh, army. Um, Wilson's 14 points, good idea, doesn't actually happen, uh, never gets ratified uh, uh, in the United States, so we don't sign up, for, the United States doesn't sign up for it, uh, kind of seen as a failure, um, but also in other regards was seen as kind of progressive, right? This idea of um, um, giving colonial uh, governments some say in how they're governed, um, you know, could have uh, avoided a lot of the violence of the uh, Cold War, certainly. Uh, Wilson here, as you know, he was a professor at Princeton before he um, uh, was president. Um, so he was always kind of depicted as kind of a, you know, bookish kind of guy. Okay, World War One ends. The United States is on the winning side, um, and a lot of new immigrants use the opportunity to show their patriotism. So that emboldens these new immigrants after the war. Uh, the folks who were against the war, on the other hand, are seen it with even increased suspicion. So socialists, um, pop, even populists and progressives, right? Like, you know, you 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 coward, cowardly, right? Effectively saying, like, look, we we were all in for war and for militarism. We did it. We won. So if you were against the war, right, you're you're a loser. Um, uh, communists and socialists get the brunt of this. Um, a lot of anti-communist uh, action after World War One. Um, obviously, this is also related to um, the. Uh, um, uh, de demands for equality. Um, a lot of the um, uh, uh, civil rights movements in this time period, the 19 teens, are associated with communism, right? Because what are they asking for? The equality? Equality? Sounds a lot like, right? Um, so a lot of uh, anti-black violence is actually enacted under the auspices of actually also being anti-communist. Um, not without reason, um, that actually that's kind of the point of communism. Uh, the third international common turn, the communist international is a meeting of communists from all over the world happens in 1919. And one of the, um, p uh, goals of communism is global, right? Communism. So, so it's not without reason that people were suspicious of communism, but again, a lot of people get pulled in, uh, that had nothing that we're not trying to plot revolution. They were just, right, communists or socialists or something. Um, in 1919, there's nationwide strikes. There's a huge general strike in Seattle, shuts down the entire city, uh, and workers actually start to run the city themselves. They start to, like, they take over all of the, you know, the sanitation department and um, the, um, like, the, uh, the, tra the train and the buses and actually just start, like, running the city. So, again, that's the kind of time period of, right, workers, uh, direct action, national strikes, things like that, which again, unnerve the, um, the kind of, you know, st the, the, the middle America kind of folks. 1921, there's a huge economic recession and, uh, that, uh, hurts a lot of these movements, right? The, 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 kind of uh, workers' rights movements because it's no longer workers demanding higher wages or rights, just people out of work, right? The factories are shut down and it really kind of takes the wind out of the sails of any kind of workers' rights movement. Um, that's World War I. Not, at, you know, not even uh, one mention of mustard gas. Oh, I did mustard gas or trench warfare. Oh, or tanks. Oh. Um, so not necessary. Don't need it. It's American history, not European history. So that's World War One uh, on the domestic front. Um, if there's more questions, we'll address them in class.